Okay, so we're starting again with um, the wide area network and carrier networks. Uh, as you can see, SDN and OpenFlow today, you will see it in applied and uh, used in different environments. Uh, this is one of them. Uh, understood that not all of us may be carriers or service provider, but we all use a wide area network uh, service. And uh, that's what, you know, um, the two angles that actually our speakers today, Matt Palmer and Harry Petty, are going are gonna to talk about. So without further ado, I'll leave it to our speakers. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Harry. Thanks, Isabel. Well, good morning, everybody. Now, before we, we get started, one question that I'd like to ask is to find out how many people here are, since we started the tutorial for product managers, how many people here, if by show of hands, are actually in product management or product marketing? All right, not bad. So I um, want to make sure that we have the focus to, to where we, what we're going to talk about today. And why don't we dive into, here we go, the details um, around what we're going to talk about. And particularly, what is the definition, at least as we're talking about it from an ONF perspective, of the WAN and the carrier network? Um, what, do people, um, what would people like to do on these networks that they can't do today? What are some of the things they can't do today that they would like to do? Um, and what are some of the things that we just can't do on the carrier networks? Um, as well as some of the things that we might be able to actually implement and, uh, and take forward. So with that, we're going to introduce ourselves. Um, my name is Matt Palmer. I'm a partner over at Wiretap Ventures. And we're also the curators of SDNCentral.com, uh, which is tracking everything around um, software-defined networking, network virtualization, and, uh, and open flow, whether it's open source projects, um, products that are shipping, or just interesting topics that are associated with that. And I'm, I'm Harry Petty, and I'm the VP of Marketing and Biz Dev over at Velo Systems. And we're a company that is building a network virtualization platform for data center interconnect. And, uh, and I'll talk to you a little more uh, through some use cases to give you an idea exactly what Velo Systems does. Great. Now, let's talk a little bit about the definition of the networks that we're going to go ahead and talk about. Harry, you want to start with the WAN? Sure. Yeah, so um, the, the topic here, uh, the title of our session is WAN Networks and Carrier Networks. Um, wh what I'd like to do, just starting out in some level setting here, is I've got some use cases that I'm going to talk about. That's principally of, uh, what's of interest uh, for the discussion. But I don't want to just talk about a place in the network. And I don't really want to just talk about who owns the network, but really through these use cases, talk about data center interconnect. And here, uh, the first one that uh, we found very compelling was content delivery data center internetworks. And the kind of companies that we've run into that are interested in this kind of solution uh, were enterprises who are trading market data. Um, they are looking for ultra low latency uh, interconnects between their data center sites and some of the colo locations with the exchanges and they're very interested in managing uh, this deterministic low latency metropolitan area uh, interconnect. So uh, the, things that, the things that they're interested in managing range from Ethernet topic of, uh, of this uh, uh, the standards effort, uh, the circuit connections or the optical pathways uh, as well as being able to integrate their applications through APIs. Another use case will be uh, business continuity or disaster recovery networks. And think of companies that uh, have a RTO, recover time objective, less than four hours. Uh, all large banks, uh, again, early adopters in this area, uh, fit into this mold. And uh, a number of technologies uh, are required, both switched and circuit. And it covers uh, a range of, uh, of platform solutions so that these networks will be simple, reliable, and also economical to operate. And finally, uh, business agility, a, a topic I saw Dan Pitt mention uh, earlier in, in his talk as, as an objective of SDN. Um, how, do the, how do you do that? And I'll touch on some of the requirements for that in this use case. But essentially, look beyond your, your resource pool as being just one data center location, but really think about it as multiple sites. We've run into uh, our customers who have six 10 data centers which they want to interconnect. And so treating this as one global pool and what does it require to do that? Matt? Thanks. So on the carrier side, what we cho chose to do is to pick two use cases that I'm continually hearing about through our clients over at Wiretap Ventures. One is what's the service provider wireline network look like and what does OpenFlow and SDN mean to that? 
Um, two is what about the mobile access network? And that one's probably more exciting because that's the one that we continually hear a lot of interesting things about. And before we dive into those, I, I, I want to say that these are, not these are just representative. They're by far not the only carrier use cases, but they're the two that we chose to talk about today. Now, one of the things that we decided to, to attempt to pull together for product managers, and before anyone starts to throw quivers or stones at us about the numbers, these are actually meant to be representative and to sort of start to drive a thought process as it relates to thinking about SDN and how to start to grab projects and create projects that could be approved by senior management. And so what we did was start to look at where is the spend today um, in, in terms of network spend, um, which depending on how you slice it is in total between 60 and 70 billion dollars. How do you then slice that up by what portion of that goes to SDN and when? And then what portion of that moves to a use case, or, or each particular use case, so you can start to come up with a very rough estimate for that. Now, with this is the, very, is the very first level idea of how big some of these potential use cases could be. Now, the other piece to sort of caveat that is what, what's missing there is there has not been applied any filters around how are customers adopting this and what speed could they adopt it. So you'll probably see these numbers whack down when you want to do your own, your own estimation. But secondly, um, you'll also notice that it doesn't apply any sales filters to it, which is going to be organizational specific as to whether you could actually sell these technologies that are out there. So with all my caveats aside, what we really wanted to do was to start to say, if we start to assume that, that, that there's some big use cases as it relates to SDN and the carrier and the WAN space, what might they be and what might that look like? And so we went off and actually pulled a number of former executives from Cisco, Juniper, and Brocade had them run through a bunch of numbers, and this was the aggregation of what we had said of, without the filters of the internal or external market validators, how big could this potentially be? Okay, I guess that's me. That's you. This is the clicker. Okay, so in this discussion, let's start out with just why this wide area network discussion is, is relevant um, for product managers here at an SDN conference. Uh, number one, so data center interconnection is a topic that, uh, that I haven't heard too much within, within o ONF except in preparation for this, uh, this conference, and it's an important subject. Disaster recovery is a mission critical um, solution for all kinds of clouds, large enterprises, and even service providers for their own data centers. And whenever you talk about any of these subjects, um, business continuity, business agility, um, we, we have to talk about server connections, and we have to talk about storage connections. Both are needed. And, and then a very ripe topic today, uh, big data. Um, there are huge opportunities with distributed data as well as the, uh, the distributed applications. And so healthcare is an example where you'll find that uh, big data involved in wide area network connections is of interest. So what are the challenges here? Well, one of the challenges is that for the enterprise, the people there working at the firms um, basically are not as familiar with wide area network technology or, or optical network technology. So they're lacking in some of the WAN uh, expertise and, and sometimes they outsource uh, those, those circuits. The uh, service provider experience um, in, in enterprise use cases is, uh, is also um, lagging, I, I shall say. Uh, so we're covering some of these use cases to essentially uh, share uh, some things that we've actually run into uh, with these large enterprises. Um, if you implement a solution in real life, um, not lost on any of you product managers, um, you need the open flow switches, you need the open flow controller, you need the transport uh, interconnect, uh, you need all of these things as well as that API layer uh, to enable some of the applications to um, know what's happening in the network in real time and also to react or, uh, or ask for services. And finally, um, we think that some of the simple solutions, uh, which I'm going to touch on initially, uh, will be real drivers for business and, and that they can be deployed this year in 2012 in some pilot projects with pioneers. Oh. So, I didn't realize that. Thank you. Okay. So the first use case here was uh, uh, 
in essence, a ultra-low latency implementation uh, involving uh, high-frequency trading, hedge fund kind of uh, firms, and also major banks that have uh, uh, brokerage operations. Um, these have very strict latency SLAs associated with them. Um, these companies are early adopters because they're looking at uh, IT as a competitive advantage and really want to be able to uh, employ that technology uh, to get an edge. So uh, they make rapid investments in, in new technology. Um, the solution would be to really have a best-in-class optical delivery solution, but really to employ a hybrid switched and circuit network um, under a centralized control and, and monitoring scheme so that you can continuous, continuously uh, see the performance of the net. Delay problems, jitter problems, head of line blocking have been some of the challenges and issues that uh, these firms have had as they've looked at their multicast networks and the delivery of this market data information to trading servers. So when you have a distributed trading uh, type of application, um, you look at SDN as a way to dynamically allocate that bandwidth and ensure the right QoS treatment for this high priority traffic. So here's just a graphical depiction of what I'm talking about, where you see data center gateways at the client sites. And as I said, some of these firms have six to 10 of these sites within a major metro area, as well as exchanges where there are co-located servers which uh, obtain some of the market data. But in many cases, uh, market data from different sources is required to be aggregated for, for uh, analysis and then for action. So uh, this is essentially a uh, ultra-low latency metropolitan area interconnect. All right, so the next use case. So here we're talking about business continuity or disaster recovery. And I'm sure you're not um, unaware that there's a kind of silo uh, organization division between SAN administrators, network administrators, potentially uh, application or server administrators. And so uh, how do they get visibility on the network connection for that data center interconnect? So this is a problem for them. And in the case of uh, uh, you know, a very uh, important DR network, uh, you want to have that network ready when you need to use it. So how do you get a simple, economical, and reliable infrastructure to address that? That's the problem. Uh, many of these SAND administrators have felt that that network is a black hole and they don't get the visibility they need. So if you implement uh, an SDN to basically pull in the information from whether it's a LAN interconnect, if you're running storage over Ethernet, if you're running a circuit uh, interconnect between the DR sites, active active data centers, and potentially uh, tertiary backup sites, um, you can provide this central intelligence uh, through a monitor, through a monitor, and deliver a network service to ensure the priority, um, the route policy, and uh, and also the QoS treatment for those synchronous replication flows uh, in real time. All right, so here's a picture of a, of a customer that uh, we're working with. It's a Fortune 500 bank. They have a multi-tenant scenario because they have very successful subsidiaries that uh, generate a lot of profit for the company. So corporate IT has given autonomous control to these two subsidiaries to manage their own IT operations, so they're optimizing them. They have uh, synchronous storage replication needs between locations, and here I'll just put up a on the far right, there's a, a diagram uh, of the topology. So they have a shared network infrastructure um, denoted by these color codes, but also they're managing them separately, and some of the footprints for the equipment actually are in different locations. So the bottom picture is providing a, a logical view of, uh, of the interconnect. So if I have synchronous replication occurring, let's say between the blue set of server and storage equipment, that data is continuously actively mirrored between locations. 
where the path goes is not really important. From a logical view, we want to be sure that those flows from where they originate across the gateways and to the remote location are continuously available and maintain a very tight SLA in order to uh, guarantee uh, fast, high-performance operation of the replication application. And then if you look at the, uh, um, the other sites then, they're also having synchronous replication with a dif different set of vendors' equipment. And uh, they're employing uh, VM migration. Uh, they want some mobility for their applications. Uh, but when you move applications from one site to another, the application data needs to go with it. And so in this case, we're looking at um, orchestrated um, mobility and management, both of server applications and storage data. Now the way this is all pulled together then is uh, most importantly if we think about um, the controller, the uh, open flow controller and the applications that sit on top. And so here you see um, Velo is building a, a very powerful network operating system called Velos in our controller and in the network elements. And through that this orchestrated control can be delivered for network as a service and you can build applications on top. And the first application that we're building is a syn synchronous replication uh, manager and monitor. And that can be then provided as a dashboard or tied into um, various vendors' uh, uh, applications to provide this network service. And of course, uh, as, as all of we've seen in, in papers and discussions, there are many other applications that can then be introduced as services on top of this, uh, this controller. Let's go to the third use case then. So this one's about agility. And for business agility, we're talking about workload mobility between locations. And as I alluded to earlier, the application data uh, needs to be accessible. So that, uh, that workload, if you have a distributed application, um, there are many applications that uh, need to talk to each other, server to server. And those servers, some of them, have application data that, that they're reliant on. So where is that logical unit? Where is that C drive, so to speak? And then if you want to be able to uh, do planned maintenance, um, some other kind of optimization on your uh, physical infrastructure, um, then virtually you move compute, um, network policies, and storage at the same time. So, to address these problems, again, SDN seems like an ideal solution to provide automation and visibility uh, for these connections. And so you can carve out the bandwidth for, let's say, a, pl a planned migration of server and associated application data. Coordinate both the switched and the, uh, the transport uh, forwarding planes to be able to move that traffic uh, to the next location. So I will give you a kind of a graphical uh, image of what I'm talking about. Um, and in this case, although we've all been talking about networking predominantly, um, we realize that uh, there's compute orchestration, um, there is also the, uh, the network template serving uh, all of those servers. What is the topology? What are the policies associated with those connections for the, server, uh, the servers in this distributed application? Um, if you want this to boot up in that remote site, and to have those servers be able to talk to each other, you need to take that template and apply it in that next location. So how do you do that? If you have network services, think in terms of uh, security, VPNs, um, load balancing, uh, application delivery control, uh, as well as uh, uh, firewalls. Uh, so those network services should be also retained and enforced in the next location. And then the storage part of the network. So again, what is the topology of those connections? What's the mapping that uh, exists? And so these different network templates then uh, can actually be uh, de monitored, defined through a hybrid switched in circuit network. And then in concert, essentially, you're gonna support movement of this, think of it as a container that has uh, the minimum set of information that's required for the endpoints, for the network templates, the network services, the storage network templates, and the storage uh, endpoints. And so, uh, so now you can essentially be able to manage this as a global pool.
All right, so I ran through a number of scenarios here for you. And uh, the, the question is, when do these things happen? In what order? And uh, I can't uh, claim to have a crystal ball really to, to predict this. But I can say that based on pain points and some firsthand experience in dealing with uh, some of the institutions, as I mentioned, in the financial services industry, um, there are some very simple problems uh, that need to be solved, basic problems, let me say. Perhaps they aren't so simple. But OpenFlow and SDN definitely look like they can lend themselves to solving that. So there is a strong appetite and a need to, to solve these problems in latency-sensitive latency applications. And so we think that um, within the coming 12 months, um, pilots for these kind of solutions will, uh, will appear uh, in these uh, financial services uh, networks. Um, that point about agility, which I mentioned earlier, so in, within private clouds, as you try to uh, implement uh, an agile uh, compute and, and storage and network solution, um, you're going to need to address this, uh, this concept of the container. And there are orchestrated stacks uh, for managing cloud data centers where um, plugging in uh, SDN makes perfect sense and that can help facilitate this. And we think that this is the next ripe area based on the amount of interest that we see uh, in, uh, in implementing a more agile uh, cloud solution. And then finally, we think that all of these large enterprise type solutions that I spoke about are opportunities for service providers to adopt and provide a value add service above and beyond transport. And so business continuity as a service would be a candidate for something like that. But of course that requires, ties into the OSS and BSS systems. And so we put that down in phase three as a kind of a longer term uh, activity. So with two, per two perspectives um, basically for, uh, for the audiences here, if you're an enterprise, you look at SDN and you see this as an opportunity perhaps uh, if you're looking at a multi-vendor network architecture or you're looking at a second network architecture for the primary one that you've adopted, OpenFlow and SDN looks very promising based on the capabilities and some of the simple use cases with direct benefits that uh, you can implement. The idea is through SDN to automate and simplify operations and therefore achieve an ROI uh, from uh, essentially going through virtualization or implementing some of those use cases I spoke of. And also programmatically uh, running your network and providing the, uh, uh, the rich APIs for storage as well as for um, server applications to be able to employ network as a service. And as I said, uh, for service providers, think opportunistically about uh, new classes of service uh, to deliver these for the large enterprises that are in your, your regional service area. Matt. Great, thanks, Harry. Yeah. So, uh, so before I get into the carrier um, <coughs> network side, uh, first of all, Harry, your, your use cases were really exciting, and, and I appreciate learning about them because I re came to two realizations as I was li listening to it. Um, one is I may end up talking fast because one, I'm so excited about the use cases and things that are happening with SDN um, that I have a hard time containing my passion. So, the second one, which might be a bigger contributor, is that I'm over caffeinated because my my two-year-old got up um, at 5:30 this morning. So. Um, if you need me to slow down, just kind of go like that, and, and I'll be good with it. I'll do this. So as it, as it relates to um, the carrier network discussion, and we've spent a lot of time at Wiretap um, speaking with end carrier customers, vendors, um, and people who are thinking about how to go off and build these next generation networks. We saw that there's some really big relevancy as it relates to the carrier networks when it comes to the business of SDN and what does that mean. So number one is that it's a huge spend and a very large market, um, as we all know. But that's going to drive a lot of the relevancy in terms of use cases and where we'll see people prioritize and focus first. Second is what we continually hear is that these carrier networks, particularly as we defined them, um, they're mission critical, meaning it's not like a, one company goes down if these goes down. It's lots of companies go down or organizations go down. Um, and then the second or the third is that their costs are out of control. And we hear this continually as it relates to the mobile access network and mobile backhaul networks in terms of getting P 
people on dealing with subscriber growth, very similar to some of the things that we're going to hear later today about the data center growth and what that means, um, is the hyperscale and the, and, the, and the super growth in terms of virtual machines. We're seeing the same thing on the mobile side. So we're seeing that there's a massive, massive cost issue. And lastly, is we're finding that there's a plethora of use cases out there. And sort of as I, as I led into it, it's easy to get excited about one that may be shiny or look really cool. But what's really important is how do we then tie that back to the business? Um, and how do we tie that to both solving a customer problem, but also being able to generate revenue and to generate adoption for these SDN technologies? So as we look at that, there's a couple of challenges that we run into. And, and the first one is, and I can't over overemphasize it, is that these are arguably the most important networks in the world. Now, what does that translate into? Is that it translates into change is very hard and then oftentimes may be very slow. Um, so that may mean that there's a lot of customer interest in these use cases, but we may have to sort of temper that with the customer demand in terms of what is practical for them to actually go off and go deploy. Correlated to that is that these are incredibly or especially complex networks and, and environments where things absolutely positively have to go right. Um, that again is one of these things that as it relates to these carrier networks as we defined earlier, may slow a little bit of the adoption down, um, but that doesn't diminish A from the importance and nor does it, does it diminish to the need to have a strong roadmap to address these use cases if this is a market that you address. Um, and that kind of gets to point number four, which is to, compared to a number of other use cases that we've seen out there, there's arguably some very easy and very straightforward ROIs as it relates to these carrier networks. So it's going to be this balance of sort of the difficulties of getting it in and changing the business processes with um, combined with the, gee, we want to move faster because the ROI is so much, is so much higher. So let's take that down to the next one. So as we think about what, where mm -hmm. SDNs are most useful in carrier networks, and again, I'll focus this back to the, the experiences we've had at Wiretap in terms of speaking with carriers and speaking with vendors, is that the key attributes for an SDN for the carrier networks is where is agility and dynamicism, um, if that's truly a word, I made it up, um, required? Um, where is traffic growth just so incredibly rapid that you can't scale any other way? Um, and where the management of specific flows is incredibly important to the business. And the reason we bring this up is that there's a lot of cool use cases that we hear about on these carrier <coughs> networks that don't necessarily, necessarily relate to that and could be, could be one of those things that could be a rabbit hole that you're jumping down and looking into if, if the use cases aren't focused on these type of applications and use cases today. So if we start to look at where could there potentially be some early adopter use cases that fit for the carrier networks, I've got two that I wanted to share. And these are ones, again, that we've heard directly from, um, from end customers, from carriers, as well as from vendors. One is this convergence <laughs> of Wi-Fi, of, of really unlicensed spectrum with licensed spectrum. Um, and there's a good reason for this. One is the huge growth of mobile devices, as I suspect everybody here has brought at least two with them um, to tie into just the Wi-Fi network. Um, but the second is how do you scale and grow that and provide a decent level of service to all of those folks? And in particularly, how do you deal with handoffs from different devices that have different, um, uh, different degrees of whether they'll stick on Wi-Fi or whether they'll move to a 3G, 4G, or even a Pico cell network? So that's one. The second one is a cross data center hyperscale as it relates to carrier Ethernet services. So separate out, which I think we'll hear a lot more about sort of um, other use cases around that, but we are continually hearing where, hey, I'm getting a metro Ethernet and I'm sharing it across the building. How do I track those flows? How do I allocate it? How do we bill for it? Those are two use cases that we're hearing about. So where is it? Whoops, thank you. Um, so where are there the market opportunities beyond those two use cases? Well, I mentioned those two. Um, the other one that I think is relevant for us to talk about is traditional wireline networks. And the reason I bring that up is what we've heard from customers um, is that that may actually be the last network in the carrier's um, infrastructure to transition over to SDN. And this gets into the notion of today that's the bread and butter of the revenue for most of these carriers. It's the most risk, um, it's the most risk averse portion of the network. 
but yet it's also the most absolute critical one. And that's why we're recommending to our clients and to folks that we talk to, to start to look at the alternative use cases as opposed to going head on into the existing wireline infrastructure that's there. As it relates to the mobile network side, what we're finding is that there's a huge amount of interest and a huge amount of demand. And as I listen to these conversations, it's not too, it's not too dissimilar to the conversations that, that I've heard a lot from, from Dan around what people were saying about the data center and virtual machine side of the, of the SDN equation two years ago. But what we're sensing is that the adoption curve for that is somewhere three to five years out, at least at a broad scale, um, due to product cycles, customer qualification, and then actually rolling that out. And there's also some open questions for us who may be vendors, um, which is, will the carriers build their own homegrown solutions like some of the largest world data center folks? Or will they buy solutions from, the, from, from, from established long-term partners and vendors? And if they do where, do, where do they acquire those technologies from? Are they from the OSS vendors? Or are they from the traditional network vendors? Or like I said, is it back to they're going to roll their own and, and kind of build it on their own? Um, so that's why we see that this overall market landscape for the carrier side to be a bit more complex than maybe some of the other use cases that, that you'll hear about over the course of the next couple of days. So, um, so what I wanted to do was to take and walk through a sample use case. Again, this is one that we've heard from customers, um, and I'm not, it's by far not the only one, um, but is a representative one which is particularly around this roaming issue around mobile devices in very high density locations. And you know, an example that we started to pull together for this was, let's say you're at the you're at University of Michigan, you have 100,000 people in the football stadium, and everyone has between one and two mobile devices, and they all want to watch the replay of the last play. That's, that's the type of use cases and, and the types of density that we're starting to hear about. And we start running into everything from there's a spectrum issue to there's also a backhaul issue as to how do we share that and then how do you share that across multiple carriers because the guys over at, uh, over at U of M don't necessarily want to have five different types of access points for five different types of carriers so how do you solve that that business level problem of of supporting all of the people who are there to watch a football game um, while also being able to um, actually d d deliver a service across different constituents So, so why you can't do this today? Well, there's not a whole lot of interfaces to tie in the, the there's emerging, but they're not quite there yet around the Wi-Fi and the, um, the spectrum-based products. There's not a real way to say, hey, if we're going to share a Wi-Fi infrastructure and we're going to share an Ethernet um, or even an optical-based um, um, mobile backhaul solution, there's not a clear way how to actually share those resources back and forth. And then as we start to look at it, we start to say, well, what are some of the prerequisites in order for this to happen? And this will also get into why we think it's going to take a little bit of time for these use cases to be deployed. One is, is that we need access points and, and cell stations to be able to talk to the upper layers of the network and be able to pass data back and forth, say, over to a Hotspot 2.0 controller, as well as to an OpenFlow or an SDN controller to control a couple of items. One is going to be the Wi-Fi's. Second is going to be the Ethernet switches that those are controlled to. And third is that you're going to have to deal with the Metro Ethernet, let's say we're using that for now, but the NIDs or the service assurance technology that's in use so that this technology can be shared across multiple carriers as well as multiple types of folks. Um, and ultimately, the goal is to deliver a business benefit, which is enhance the experience of watching the game over at Michigan Stadium, um, but to deliver that through a shared infrastructure because there's really no way that you can replicate, say, five different carriers over at that infrastructure. Um, so if we, if we ask the question of, well, what could that look like? And I'm not claiming that this is a deployment screen by any stretch of the imagination, but what could it look like? Well, you can start to see that, that you're going to have the Hotspot 2.0. You're going to have an SDN and OpenFlow controller around that. You're going to go off and have the Ethernet switches. You're going to have the wireless LAN um, access points. And you're going to have the Ethernet NIDs, all of which need to be controlled and coordinated together to deliver that solution. Um, now, there's probably a whole lot more to it than, than what we have here because, again, these are just the early use cases and examples that we're hearing directly from customers. And these are far, far from production. Um, but I'm happy to discuss more in, in detail if anyone has, has more questions later. And 
So then getting into what do we see as the potential waves of adoption as it relates particularly to the carrier Ethernet world um, or to the carrier network world, one is we're seeing a lot of interest on the research networks. And um, Matt Davey from Indiana, who you'll, you'll hear from later today, has got some great stuff um, that they're working on around that. We definitely see and continue to hear the mobile access layer from an adoption perspective and a need perspective be one. And then lastly is we see the traditional wired networks being the last piece to be adopted. And again, you never know on the continuum whether that's going to be three years or 10 years or somewhere in the middle. But we do see that that's going to be the last point of adoption, at least as it relates to making changes to the wholesale network. So um, a couple of key takeaways as we, um, that we wanted to encourage you, encourage you to, to think about as you, as you look at what use cases to focus on and where to sort of look at SDN and OpenFlow for building those products. One is um, we need to choose the use cases very wisely. Think about market size, think about the timing, and think about the business drivers. If it's for cost optimization, it's probably a little lower on the priority. If it's um, to deal with, with scale out or hyperscale growth, that's probably pretty darn high on, on, on the priority list. Um, next is qualify customer interests from customer demand. Um, what's really cool about OpenFlow and SDN is the amount of interest from end customers and about all the wonderful things they can do is incredibly high. But as product managers, we have to think about what does that translate into in terms of demand, in terms of what would they actually go off and then buy, and where would they allocate budgets. Um, and so as we think about that, let's think about is this, does SDN provide for a use case an incremental improvement? Um, does it provide a wholesale, does it require a wholesale change to the way that you do something today, meaning a large business process change? Who's the economic buyer and what budget is this going to come out of? And then what's the compelling reason to buy? Meaning, you know, what's the hair on fire or, or the bleeding from the neck problem that's going to make somebody say, I have to adopt this in a certain time period? And then lastly, as it relates to these carrier use cases, um, Particularly, you know, we're recommending to our clients that they get experience with these research networks today, find ways to participate in that, and understand where that necessary, what that means and where they can play. Um, two is focus on becoming part of the hyperscale mobile use case, um, because we see that just being an incredibly huge exploding use case on the carrier network side. And then lastly, as you think about the marketing message and how you communicate that to the customer, Focus less on the how, meaning how we do this and what are the bits and bytes and wh what happens, and focus more on the what in terms of the business benefits, the ROIs, um, and why they should be deploying this and what they can do that they couldn't do, what they can do with, with OpenFlow and SDN that they couldn't do today. And with that, we'll open it up to a couple questions. A bit slow, but may I have a question? So yes. uh, maybe it will be a little bit technical, but uh, based on your presentation, I, I think that both of your companies implemented some circuit switch ex extension to OpenFlow. Is that right, somehow? And I was just wondering, uh, will you, uh, do you plan to uh, introduce these circuit switch extension to OpenFlow, to the OpenFlow standard? So I'll just repeat the, the question as I understood it. And, okay. and so uh, the question is, um, based on the presentation, um, you believe that uh, and Velo uh, is working on the uh, extensions for OpenFlow. A uh, number of our uh, engineers are in the other sessions and participating in the, the working group ac activities. And yes, uh, the results of those extensions uh, will be released as part of the standard, submitted as part of the standard process for, uh, for adoption. Absolutely correct. OK, thank you. <laughs> Don't be shy. That was a good question. Thank you. Any other question? Anyone? And if you could actually introduce yourself and maybe mention the company you're, um, you're working with before you ask the question, it will help our speakers get more perspective as well. Anyone? Oh, yeah. I have a question. Um, Rob Tompkins, I work for Sienna. Wondering, in your use cases, you, you show a nice rollout as far as uh, initial applications, that sort of thing. Um, and you, you highlighted at one point, you know, longer term wireline networks. When, when you say 
those longer-term wireline networks? Do you see it more as uh, open flow as an overlay on those networks, or do you actually see more of a pure play open flow type operational environment there? Well, what we're seeing is, um, and, I, and I hate to give you the cop-out answer if we're seeing both, um, but in reality is that we're seeing both, and a lot of it's dependent on the geography, um, the type of wireline access that they're connecting to, and then who's the actual buyer and what they're trying to, what they're trying to accomplish that. So unfortunately, it's not as easy as just saying there's, there's two great big buckets and there's sort of one camp and the other, but it's, it's, it's incredibly use case dependent is what, is what we're finding. Um, but, we're still, but for both of those use cases, the consistency is there's a lot of questions being asked about it, but there's not a whole lot of, of, of people saying, this is, we're gonna go try and flip these wireline networks tomorrow. Um, the consistency is, oh my gosh, that's my biggest revenue driver today, and if I drop that ball, I can't do anything else. And that's, I'd say, the consistency that we hear on the wireline networks um, as it relates to, to thinking about adopting the new technologies. Another question is, uh, a, a lot of what I saw up there was around new services and, and adapting services. The cost equation, how, how is that factoring into all this? What, what are you seeing these guys, um, wh are, what are you saying to them about, about the cost benefits, and especially in something like more of a hybrid type model? So I can, I can try to uh, address that. So on the cost equation, um, so no, number one, um, we're shipping uh, transport product today for software-defined network implementations or network virtualization implementations. And so, so there's a, absolutely an ROI and an economic uh, equation that uh, we satisfy for, for these uh, installations. Um, in addition, as we talk about the uh, complete platform with the open flow controller and the hybrid switched and circuit network, these are actually the subject of pilot implementations as, uh, as, as the customers see, I make this investment in this one area and uh, basically I want to be able to evolve my network uh, into an open flow compliant uh, SDN production environment. And again, in that case, um, the, um, we haven't uh, launched these products, so controller pricing and a number of these other things you know, aren't, aren't set, but from our view, the, uh, the merchant silicon components and, and other elements, uh, as well as on the, uh, the forwarding plane, make it all look like it's well within the envelope for uh, you know, affordability. And, and I think the comparison to the substitute, which might be a more elaborate three-tier architecture with other parts of it, the, the, the TCO is actually what is driving the conversation. And so, uh, so I think that automation and visibility is making that TCO equation look attractive for the economics. And, and maybe to, to add on to, to Harry, what, what we're hearing as we, as we chat with our clients and actually as we get feedback into SDN Central is we typically hear when folks are looking to roll out, let's say, a new type of network is they're not assuming that their budget's gonna be slashed or to be saved. It's really about doing something new, which, which I think gets back to the sort of this wireline, meaning, hey, they work today, in most cases, they're profitable, and so th those are sort of to the pendulum of very being very risk averse. Um, to the new services side, it comes down to a, hey, if I'm going to build, let's say, a metro Ethernet network today versus one that I built yesterday, if it was going to cost me $10 million to do it yesterday, I'm still expecting it to cost me $10 million to do it today, but I'm expecting a whole lot more services on top of that. Oh, another question. Great. Hi, uh, Steve Martin, Ruckus Wireless. Your um, case with the uh, sports stadium is kind of an interesting one in terms of multi-tenant architecture for multiple carriers over the top. Um, do you think, when you think about applying this to that application, are you thinking about this as more of a semi-static configuration and effectively replacing like a VPN conf or a VLAN configuration for segregating carrier traffic? Or are you thinking about literally dynamically shifting based on uh, user load demand? Most of the folks we've talked to are, more, are interested in more on the dynamic side than they are on the static. Because they look at it and view, hey, the static stuff I have today, it may not be ideal, but I, I at least have it today. But when it comes to the dynamic side, that's where we're seeing and hearing a lot more of the interest. Do you have um, some concepts of 
you know, how quickly the network could adapt to a changing load. I mean, literally, when you say, you know, if you gave the example of uh, work, looking at an instant replay, this is stuff we're actually dealing with quite a bit, um, where perhaps that instant replay is offered from one carrier versus another, and therefore shifting network resources in response to that instantaneous demand. Mm -hmm. So I would say that the folks that we're speaking with today are just asking the questions about that use case mm -hmm. and how to do it. I would say that they're pretty long ways away from actually identifying, well, what's the how? Right. And, and, and what's the nitty gritty details around that? Um, so I would just sort of preface the use case as, this is one that we've heard about at multiple places at multiple times, but I, w I, would, I definitely wouldn't claim that there's a, a true sort of answer or architecture that they're looking at today to solve it. Other than to start to look at it and say, shoot, what could we do, and when might the time frame be that we could actually do something like this? Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Absolutely. Any other questions? Oh, one more. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Vipin from Ericsson. You talked about uh, storage connectivity across the van. Uh, now, I understand that there is a latency issue and all that kind of stuff, but. I cannot, I didn't understand like how SGN is coming into play here because all you need is maybe like you have a van pipe, you set CIR, EIR based on your connection and that, that's how you manage the traffic. And mostly on the van side you have fixed pipe, fat pipe. So how is SGN coming into those kind of, uh, those kind of use cases for connecting storage across the van? Thanks for asking that, that question. I didn't catch your, your company, but I, I work for Ericsson. Oh, okay. Uh, Arista? Ericsson. Oh, Ericsson. Okay. Yep. So, uh, so the question was with regard to the SDN applicability to storage connections, and, and I'm glad you asked that. So firstly, um, in the extensions, we're talking about managing uh, circuit connections over, over uh, transport distances, let's say 100 kilometers or less. Um, these are ripe for disaster recovery scenarios. What we discovered is actually <clears throat> that the um, topologies are more complex than strict just point to point. There are a number of replication groups. Uh, there's other traffic that's present. And so, <clears throat> again, the, uh, firstly, continuous monitoring and, uh, and, and diagnostics of these connections and uh, reporting of the SLA is a key factor for the, uh, the storage administrations. Secondly, when you're involved in a more complex uh, topology that could involve, uh, we'll start simply with just active-active with a tertiary backup, <clears throat> but you can also have a mesh type configuration in some cases, then uh, the failover plans uh, in the event of uh, different scenarios actually winds up being a little more complicated. But we do see this as um, fairly stable type of topologies, and so static routing and policy applications winds up being more uh, the case uh, that we're, we're discussing. But, uh, but the storage applications themselves are, uh, uh, or rather the vendors who make them, are desirous of having greater visibility into the, uh, the network uh, connection, uh, the policy attributes, uh, the routes, and real-time information of a protection switch or, uh, or uh, imminent uh, failure in the network, and therefore being able to react proactively uh, in the storage application. So um, there is, a, I think, as you say, uh, a static, kind of stable environment out there today, fairly rigid. Uh, the desire is for greater control, uh, visibility, and, uh, and resiliency uh, in, the, in the wide area network for those storage connections. And I also mention, we don't really care whether it's an ethernet connection or a fiber channel connection. Uh, it's running over an optical uh, transport connection. And to us, it's just a circuit. And therefore, uh, holistically, up through the dashboard, you see all your connections uh, between the data centers. Any other questions? Well, I think that was uh, that was it. Thank you very much. Thank you to both Thank of you. you. Thank you.